I bet there's audio now though, right? Let's see. Settings, audio. Let's do the one moment while I fix that up. Okay, good. All right. You can hear me now. Good. And I sound okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Let's start this all over again from the top. Welcome to episode 90. <laughs> I do appreciate the uh, the audio heads up. I thought I had it all tested out, but I guess you know how it is. Like the demo gods come for us all, I guess. Anyway, Welcome to episode 90 of Echo Office Hours. Today, we're going to do some exploration of K8 Sandra, which is an operator that you can deploy into Kubernetes and uh, Cilium Cluster Mesh. And we're going to kind of explore this in the way that might, we might explore this with like uh, in the TGIK style. So that'll be pretty fun. So let's get started. Again, what I, what I had said earlier that you all hadn't heard me say was if you're in the audience, Throw a hello in the chat. I'd love to know that you're all out there. Thank you very much, Noel, for catching me on the audio. I do appreciate it. Let's go ahead and get started here. I'm going to share my screen. All right. <clears throat> so here are our notes. And as always, if you would like to see those notes, you can go to show notes, hackmd.io slash at echo live, and you will find these under episode 90. And that's where you can get the notes. Today, let's go check out the newsletter. See what, uh, that's not what I wanted. Hmm. Let's just go to the newsletter. So if you go to psyllium.io slash newsletter, that's where all of the previous episode, ep the previous news episodes are held. Um, and this week's uh, newsletter Came out May 2nd. It was actually interesting. This one, the newsletter took a week off because KubeCon, of course, was all kind of crazy. And I just wanted to share with you some of the awesome new stuff that's happening. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Thank you. Good to see you. So in the newsletter, we have Kubernetes Goat implementing Cilium Tetragon. And Kubernetes Goat, for those who are unaware, is a... Deployment of Kubernetes that is that is knowingly vulnerable, right? So it's an interesting way of exploring the security surface of Kubernetes and all of the things associated with it. And one of the interesting things that they've recently done is they've gone ahead and implemented things like Tetragon. And so in this way, you can deploy Tetragon in a standalone mode, not, not deploying it with your CNI, just Tetragon itself. And then there's actually some pretty interesting exercises exploring Tetragon itself, which I thought was pretty cool. So definitely check that out. And I think it might be kind of fun to do that one on um, an Echo Office Hours. Maybe I'll do that next week. The Hubble Data Source plugin for Grafana is out. And this one is actually pretty cool. You know, um, when you think about Grafana, Typically speaking, the way that people uh, work with Grafana is that they leverage, uh, you know, Prometheus as a data source, right? And Prometheus gathers a bunch of metrics from uh, Prometheus-enabled endpoints, puts them all into kind of a data store, and then Grafana can use that as a data store to create virtual, to create visualizations and those sorts of things, which is pretty cool. One of the amazing powers of Hubble is that it is also a tremendous source of data. Right, we can actually show you, like, if you look at Hubble Observe or Hubble UI or any of those things, you can see a tremendous amount of data in the form of events that show what's actually happening on the network. And if you have deployed Tetragon, also what's happening at the application layer. And so, what this represents is a new data source for Grafana that is Hubble. And that's actually pretty neat as well. So, if you're, if you have Cilium deployed and you're playing with Grafana and stuff, first of all, just reach out because we'd love to work, on, work with you on that stuff. But if you haven't, but otherwise explore the Hubble data source plugin for Grafana and start and start kind of looking at all of the data that you can get from Hubble. Pretty cool stuff. The videos both for CiliumCon and for KubeCon are out. If you would like, if you have not seen them, definitely check them out. One of my favorite videos, I have to give my shout out to my buddy Karsten. 
I absolutely loved it. Let's see if I can find it here. Yes. So Karsten Nelson did a tremendous job of his talk <laughs> in his talk at Cilium Con. And one of the things I love about it was that he wasn't afraid of the obvious pun, right? Karsten embraced that obvious pun. He works at a company that works very similar to, to works on Ikea stuff. And so he was describing the stack that he has deployed and he was leveraging the Ikea instruction set and all of the different parts that would go into a cluster, <laughs> which I thought was absolutely brilliant. And I'm sure that you probably also appreciate a good pun out there. <clears throat> Other news this week. So we have EBC, EBPF TC filters for egress traffic, a detection of a denial of service attack using cloud-based Kubernetes using eBPF. It's actually pretty cool. EdgeBit Agent, which is an eBPF used to submit real-time SBOMs and dependency usage for EdgeBit. I'm actually pretty curious about this one. I haven't explored it, but that's actually on my list of things to look into. They have, um, Bill has, of course, announced the EB decks. If you're interested in seeing the images for EBs, they are all now inside of the EB decks. Pretty cool. A new, a new form of mesh for Cilium. So we're going to explore Cilium cluster mesh, which is the ability to form multiple clusters into a single mesh. And then we also have announced Cilium mesh, which is a different thing. Cilium mesh is a way to deploy another element inside of your topology that can act as effectively a transit gateway into the Cilium data path itself, which is pretty cool. So if you wanted to extend you wanted to bring in or workloads that are outside of the cluster and you want to give them identity and you want to write network policy for them, those sorts of things, Cilium Mesh is a pretty good way to do that. Definitely check out the blog post on that. Cilium Enterprise is now available via the Microsoft Azure Marketplace, which is pretty exciting. NetReap bring Cilium to the world outside Kubernetes. Talking about Cilium and Nomad, pretty cool. But yeah, lots of really good stuff. If you're interested in following along on the newsletter, you know where you can sign up for it. You can actually sign up for it at the um, cilium.io slash newsletter. Last couple of things that happened this week that I want to give a shout out to. So shout out to Liz and shout out to many of my good friends up at the Open Source Summit in Canada this year. Um, lots of really great stuff out there. Uh, Liz hosted a workshop on eBPF and security observability. And there's been a, just a ton of great, a, a ton of great new content out there for that. And I, I'm actually not sure if the videos are up yet. Why don't we just take a look and see? Let's see, OSS Summit. Uh, looks like maybe it's not up yet. That's a new stack. The Linux Foundation. Oh, well. Open Source Summit North America 2023 is a search term, and this is... I think this is a different thing. I think this is from, so this video, yeah, it's from 2022. And if I go to the Linux Foundation and I look at playlists, do I see Open Source Summit North America 2023? If you pull playlists, ah, not yet. Okay, so they're not up yet, but they're probably coming soon. And when they do come, you should definitely check it out. Yeah, that's fair. I know it's tough. It's actually, I mean, it's a, it's a, I'm oh, sorry. I'll highlight that question again. The question is why marketing? Why? I thought cluster mesh and cilium mesh were the same thing. It's a tricky thing. We actually solve a lot of problems with, um, sorry, let me mute that. So we actually solve a lot of different problems with cilium and the challenge becomes like, how do we actually describe all of those things that we solve with cilium in a way that, you know, keeps the, keeps the naming convention pretty clean. And that, I gotta say, that's actually, 
probably one of the more difficult problems in marketing and silly at a at isovalent. Definitely tough. So let's get into it here. I was recently asked about uh, K8 Sandra on Cilli on Kubernetes, and I thought this was actually really cool. So I'm going to explore this with you all. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and in the background start up a deployment of this. And then we'll come back to it here in a second. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and just get it kicked off here. So I'm going to leave that running in the background while we look at this. So the question I somebody came to me with was, like, can we deploy um, Cassandra on a cluster where Cilium runs? Um, and the answer, of course, is yes, because Cilium is just a CNI. And so you can deploy Cassandra on something with a CNI. That's just fine. But then as we got a little bit more into the detail of the question, we realized that the question was a little bit different than the originally asked. And the question was really like, the, the question that we needed to kind of dig into was, what are the access models for Cassandra? And when you think about it that way, it becomes a kind of an interesting different question. The access model for Cassandra is that clients that are going to put data in or take data out of Cassandra as a NoSQL store are going to need access to the nodes that Cassandra represents or that are representative of that Cassandra cluster. And if you were going to say, for example, deploy a multiple, multiple Kubernetes clusters and deploy multiple Cassandra databases or maybe DCs or data centers of Cassandra on multiple of those clusters, you would need to have, you would need to make sure that every Cassandra node is able to communicate with every other Cassandra node in either DC which means that topology-wise, what we're looking at is something more like, uh, let's see, I actually was just looking at this. We're looking at something like this, where I have multiple data centers and I have a client that can talk to any one of the nodes, but generally speaking for, rep for high availability purposes, you want to provide that client access to multiple nodes. And that means that the client needs direct access to the node itself. And when replicating back and forth between multiple sides, the proxy, the node itself that you actually talk to needs to be able to also communicate with the other nodes in another DC. Now, from a topology perspective, this is pretty interesting because it means that when you were, if you were, if your intention was to say, make one Kubernetes cluster be data center alpha and another Kubernetes cluster be data center beta, then how would you go about making it so that the nodes, the Cassandra nodes deployed as a stateful set in Kubernetes cluster alpha and Kubernetes cluster beta had access to each other? Well, it turns out that the K8 Sandra operator, which is the tool that I'm going to be using to deploy K8 Sandra onto multiple clusters, actually has a walkthrough on how to go about that. And let's just take a look through the walkthrough here. I've automated a lot of this because I wanted to do this in the interest of time, but I wanted to kind of walk through like what is actually happening here and what the model is and how it works. So, in this Helm chart, they have a, you know, a bunch of a bunch of prerequisites. Uh, they are asking you to go ahead and install the Helm repo or the Kate Sander repo in your Helm chart repositories. They are asking you to check things out, and they have a script called Setup Kind Multi Cluster. And you can actually have it deploy three clusters. You can um, determine how many kind worker nodes you want in each cluster. And then they go about deploying, and then they go about verifying the deployments of Cassandra. And then you do a get nodes, make sure you got four nodes, all that stuff. And then you cruise down here a bit further and you go ahead and you do that three times. You create all three clusters. You deploy a cert manager into each cluster. You deploy, what's next? You deploy the K8 Sandra operator into each cluster. The reason cert manager needs to be there first is that K8 Sandra operator actually leverages cert manager to handle its certificate needs, which is pretty cool. 
Then what else do we need next? So the next thing we do is kind of an interesting subtle kick. So if you're going to deploy this topology, which is three independent Kubernetes clusters, then the way that they want you to do it is you create, you deploy K8 Center operator in um, control plane mode in the first one. And in the second and third clusters, you're turning the control plane mode off. And the reason for that is that the top one is the one in the first cluster is actually going to manage the deployment of a multi DC K8 Sandra cluster. And it's going to do this by actually deploying, it's going to actually do this by orchestrating all three of these operators and managing the life cycle of clusters in all three and in, in, in the in the lower two. And I'm going to show you that. It's pretty cool how they've gone about this. And you can tell they've actually really thought about security and a bunch of other stuff, but we're going to dig into it as we go here. And then they're going through and they're actually validating that the control plane settings are correct. They should be true for the first one. And for the data plane clusters, it should be false. And we'll go ahead and prove that out as well. And then they're going to generate and install client configs, which means that the data plane, sorry, the control plane cluster is going to have kubectl configure kubectl um, access to the data plane clusters. And the reason for that is that the control plane operator needs to be able to um, deploy things into the two other operators at the uh, at the data plane side of things, right? So when you deploy a K8 Sandra multi-DC cluster in the control plane cluster, it needs to be able to basically interact with those operators and the two data plane clusters to deploy those clusters and build them up. We're going to do that as well. I'm kind of talking through this so that you can understand what we're going to do. And then we're going to do it. And I'll show you how all of that works as we go. So the next thing you do is like basically, like I said, you're going to create a cube config for each of the two data plane clusters, and you're going to put that in as a secret inside of the control plane cluster so that the operator in the control plane cluster can interact with the operators in the data plane clusters. Once that is all done, you deploy this K8 Sandra cluster resource. And here's where things get interesting. <laughs> This was the this was kind of the mind blowing part for me. So in this model, what actually happens is they deploy two Kubernetes they deploy two Cassandra clusters with three nodes each. They put them into DC one and DC two, and you can see the K8s context here. So this K8s context points to the secret that it will use to authenticate to the data plane clusters, right? So Kites, K Kind, Kates, Cassandra 1, and Kites, Kates, Cassandra 2 are the two data plane clusters in this case. And it's saying that when I deploy these two data centers from Kates, Cassandra 0, I want to deploy one data center in Kates, Cassandra 1 and one data center in Kates, Cassandra 2. And how, you might ask, will these three nodes deployed in K, kind Kate's Cassandra 1 and these three nodes in Kind Kate's Cassandra 2 be able to communicate with each other. Because if you deploy it just like this is, how would they be able to communicate with each other? If you're looking at this manifest, the answer may not be super obvious, but I'm going to give you a second because I know the delay. The answer is a networking host network true. And so this means that all six of those nodes that are deployed in the data plane clusters are going to be deployed in host networking true. Host networking true in Kubernetes means that each of these nodes are going to use the network stack of the underlying host, which is pretty interesting. Now, 
that solves the problem of how the nodes can communicate with each other. It also solves the problem of how external clients outside of the cluster can interact with these Cassandra databases and access, you know, other entities and maybe other Kubernetes clusters would still be able to access these Cassandra databases because these Cassandra databases are using the node IP addresses themselves. These Cassandra nodes, I should say, are using the node IPs. And that means that as long as the kubelet, the Kubernetes node itself is routable from all of the other nodes, then all things just work. We don't have to worry about anything more. It's all totally solved. What, you might ask, are the downsides of this particular model? So some of the downsides of this model are that you can't deploy multiple Cassandra nodes onto a single node. And arguably, that might be a feature, right? Because remember that in the Cassandra case, or in, this, in, the, in the deployment model, the way that Cassandra replicates data is that not only not no single node will have all of the all of the data for any given write. So when you write a new up a new entry into a Cassandra database, it's going to replicate that data across multiple nodes in the cluster, and it's also going to replicate that data. So I have written, I've written that I've interacted with node ten. Node ten has actually created three replicas of the data on node one, node three, and node six. And the proxy in node 10 has also interacted with node 11 and made that same write across three nodes in data center beta. Now, let's say, for example, that data center alpha and data center beta were de deployed in the same Kubernetes cluster. And we're using, uh, and we have, you know, we were using overlay networks. And so we have created replicas of this data or we have created multiple clusters into a single Kubernetes cluster, and we have uh, and we have overlap, right? Which means that node 11 and node 10 are both deployed to the same Kubernetes node, right? Now let's say I lose that node. What's interesting there is that I have actually taken out two of the replicas of this data. Sorry, I should have said. Node six and node four are deployed on the same Kubernetes node. If I lose that node, I lose those replicas. And so this is a part of the challenge of deploy of thinking about the topology as you as you deploy um, Cassandra is how can you deploy this in a way that is highly available, where the blast radius, if you lose a topology, if you lose a radius, if you lose a, a node, for example, isn't going to be affected, uh, isn't going to cost you a lot if you lose that node. In our topology, this is actually solved because, in this particular case, it's solved because a Cassandra node can only ever be deployed to a single uh, Kubernetes node. And there can be no overlap because we're actually deploying these data centers into two different clusters. So the stateful set is actually got anti-affinity configured, and we're going to look at that as well. And in that way, it basically ensures that um, these nodes are not overlapping with each other. They can only deploy onto, there can be no overlap between Cassandra nodes and kubelets. And there can also be no overlap between the DCs because they're deployed on two different Kubernetes clusters. And the benefit of that in resilience and the benefit of that in operational admin administrative overhead is pretty high, right? Like you've created an access model that really works for you across all of the things. You don't have to worry about like, uh, you know, deploying or losing any given kubelet, kubelet node because you have a core, you have a set of three. And if you bring up that new one again, then you, it'll be able to self heal. All of those things will continue to be true. And that's all in the host network space. But what if you wanted to do a different thing? What if you said, you know what? The consumers of this Cassandra database are also pods, are also work, are also applications deployed within Kubernetes clusters. And so ideally, I would like to actually not expose Cassandra to the outside world. I want to have Cassandra hosted within the cluster itself. 
And I, but I still want that behavior of deploying Cassandra into multiple Kubernetes clusters so that I can get that high availability and I can go ahead and make sure that the access model works so that multiple of these, um, so that clients when interacting with either DC, the replication stuff still works, all of that stuff still functions. We have all of that worked out. Here is where Cilium cluster mesh comes in. So in my experiment, what I've done is I've gone ahead and followed the same model of deployment that is described in this article. And I've actually set host network to false. And we're going to deploy this across. We're going to create a Cilium cluster mesh of three clusters so that the operator and the control plane cluster can interact with the two lower clusters. Replication works, all of that stuff works, and we're going to get all of this deployed and we're going to play with it a bit. So that's where I'm going to come off of this article. And we're going to come back to this later and we're going to kind of look at this a bit more. But for now, Let's jump in to how this is created on the back end. Ah, before I do that, uh, let me go back here. If you want to see the script that created this crazy thing, this is actually a copy of, uh, actually, let me go back over here for a second. It diff. So I've done a bunch of stuff to this script, but this script is actually part of the um, the example config that they actually point out in the website. So if you look in the website, the K Center website, which is here, this guy, right? They have you check out the K Center operator from GitHub. And inside of there, there's the script that they reference, setup kind multi-cluster, three nodes and three workers, et cetera. So I have actually taken that script and modified it pretty significantly because I was going to have a lot of fun with it. I was going to actually turn this into a script that could do a lot more than just what was happening before. I've removed the registry. The registry is a way of actually speeding up what gets deployed because you could have a local Docker registry that has all of the images, but it's not a pull through registry. And so it, ended up, it, it ends up being like, you have to kind of populate that registry with everything, change the, change the identity of nodes or, or the of the images you're going to deploy, all that stuff. And I decided not to explore that at this time. I've gone ahead and deployed the cluster. One of the changes I made was I made it so that every cluster has its own unique pod CIDR. So in this case, it's 10201 slash 16 or 1020 cluster ID slash 16. And the cluster IDs are one, two, and three. And that means that each cluster will have its own pod subnet unique to the cluster. I made a function for installing Cilium. And this function basically determines that the first one is going to be the, um, the Cilium install. I'm going to deploy a Hubble there, all of that stuff. And the second and third ones, I'm actually going to inherit the Cilium CA from the first one to basically make it so that we can easily go ahead and create a cluster mesh between all of these components. The next thing I do is I deploy I deploy Cilium cluster mesh. And I'm using this context mechanism to determine which piece I'm actually doing that with. And then I have written like a little dumb thing, which is the uh, cluster mesh connect. So with cluster mesh, you actually want to make a full mesh, which means that every node or sorry, every yeah, every node in every cluster is able to form a cluster mesh with every other node in every other cluster. So what this is doing is it's going ahead and actually creating that Cilium cluster mesh connect across all of the different uh, across all of the different nodes. Let me deploy Cert Manager. We deploy the uh, Sandra operator. And we deploy kubevip. Kubevip, I'm going to actually use to handle um, ARP-based load balancers. And that way, I don't have to actually, which is actually a feature that's coming to Cilium. So like in the next version of Cilium, we'll actually be able to do that directly without having to deploy kubevip. But for now, I deployed kubevip. <clears throat> what this is going to do is it's going to create a uh, 
cloud provider inside of each cluster that will support things like service type load balancer. And you can see right up above, I have already used the service type load balancer in creating the service cluster mesh. So we'll look at that here in a little bit. In the cube VIP, I've actually also gone ahead and deployed it in such a way that the range is unique to each cluster. And I'm deploying uh, IP addresses 10 through 30 for 10 to cluster ID, one, two, and three across each cluster. So I've actually made it so that 10201, 10 through 30, 10202, 10 through 30, 10203, 10230 are deployed on each of those clusters, and I can create load balancers from each of them. Then I went ahead and generated the manifests for the datamin set for kubebip. I told it to use ARP, told it what interface to use, all of that stuff. Then I went down here and I Change the numbering because I needed to index on one instead of zero, which is fine. I went ahead and called all of those new functions I created. And I did get internal so that we could actually use the name instead of the key. And that's where I'm calling the cluster mesh connect. And that is all of it so far. So what that did is it went ahead and deployed the cluster itself. And so we can look at that history right here. So here's the output of this script. It's actually going to create three clusters. The first one it creates, it's got four nodes, the control plane and four workers. I'm deploying Cilium. Here's the configuration of the Cilium piece that's being deployed, right? So I have set this to cluster ID one. I've set the name to cluster one. I have deployed ingress controller enabled true, ingress controller load balancer dedicated. I have deployed QProxy in a partial mode. All the rest of those are pretty default. Then I went ahead and deployed Cilium Hubble UI. And then I went ahead and also deployed the Hubble UI and Hubble UI backend. That was successful. And then I did a cluster mesh enable, turning on the cluster mesh functionality in this cluster. It's not connected to anything yet. I just turned it on. And then we went ahead and deployed QVIP. And we deployed Cert Manager, as we said before. And then we deployed the K8 Sender Operator. And then we did the same or similar thing for cluster two. I didn't deploy Hubble or Hubble UI inside of here, but I also did copy in the CA from the first one. All looking good. Same thing for number three. And all of those things. And then I go through and do the actual um, mesh, right? The meshing of all of these things. And because the Cilium nodes were kind of restarting in this process, what that meant was that some of the nodes kind of went away for a brief moment while that was happening. And then all five nodes, and then all the nodes became healthy. And then we were able to go ahead and create our mesh. Same thing down below. And so at this point, we have a fully meshed set of three clusters. And we can see that by doing something like cube kettle for each. If you're not aware of for each, I'm going to use it a lot in this episode. So I'm going to show you where that is. This was something that I was working on with Ahmet. It's pretty cool. And what it does is it basically gives you a tool that you can kind of run kubectl commands against multiple clusters or co multiple contexts in your cube config. So if you have multiple contexts in the current cube config that you have in your environment or that you're referencing, then you're able to actually run the same command in multiple contexts, which is pretty cool. I was saying my argument was that we should call this cube kettle exargs, but yeah, I kind of like for each two. It's probably a little closer to what's really happening. So if I do cube kettle for each, dash Q, what that does is silent the, silence the question. And I do exec ti dash n cube system. 
I do DS Cilium, it will pick a node on the daemon set that is Cilium and connect me to it. Cilium node list. And what this will do is it will show me for each, once for each cluster, for the node that I connect to, whether it sees all of the other nodes. Right, and so for this node, I've gone ahead and connected to this particular Cilium agent. And this agent sees exactly what we were expecting to see. Right, so this agent in cluster three sees cluster one, cluster two, and cluster three. It's able to understand the IPv4 address of the node itself. It's also able to understand the endpoint CIDR. So we can see that that also worked. I have 10201. These are the pod ciders for each node. 10201, 10201, 2, and 4, 1, 2, and 3, 1, 2, and 3, and 4. All of those things are in there. And the same for cluster 1 and the same for cluster 2. And if I do, let's see, control R. Cilium cluster mesh. Status. Context. So if I do Cilium cluster mesh status, the cluster that I'm pointed at, which is Cilium kind cluster one, I can also see this. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. There is actually, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. You know, what? I'm going to actually point, I'm going to point you to something that is probably the most used article on the kind dot sigs. A8.io. So this is the website for kind. And then out of here, there is a known issues section right here under the user guide. And the very first thing that you run into, or one of the early ones you run into, is this pod errors to, to too many open files. And so I have actually set these values in a persistent way on my machine because I do generally create a lot of kind clusters. So yeah, that's that's how I do that. I basically up the number of uh, max user watches and max user notifies or instances that can be that can be created. Great question though. All right. So if I go ahead and look at cluster two. And see that's also a full mesh in cluster three, a full mesh. So there we have it. And if I do cube kettle for each get SQ, get SVC dash A, we can see, for example, that the Load balancer for Selenium Ingress has been created and for the cluster mesh has been created. And those IP addresses are 10 to 172, 18, 202, and 172, 18, 202, 10, and 11. Same thing down here, 201. Same thing down here, 203. All reasonably well implemented in a way that is like reasonably easy to understand what's happening at that layer. So pretty cool. Got it all wired up. Now we're ready to start kind of playing with stuff. All right. Now, here's what we haven't done yet. Um, actually, I wanted to do this real quick. So if I did cube get all get, let's do, let's do some of the verification steps because I want to make sure this is actually working correctly. And I remember my script actually did have a problem with the K8 sender operator. So we're going to come back up here. We're going to grab this right here. Copy. And what this is going to do is just, it's going to tell me whether I've got this set correctly in each of the deployments of the K-Sander operator. And I do not. Ah, all right. So. To... 
I'm going to go ahead and fix this. Since I'm still pointed at kind cluster one, I'm going to go ahead and do this. I'm going to roll the operator and make it control plane true because I think my my uh, bash for detecting which cluster I'm on isn't actually catching. I can show you the place in the in the script where this is failing, but we'll we'll give it a second. Yeah, see, we want kind cluster one to be oper control plane true. And we want kind cluster two and three to be control plane false. Let's take a look at the setup script and see where that is failing. So that's the piece here. If cluster ID is equal to one, then install control plane two, else control plane false. So this match. It's failing, but it works. In other places, it worked up here. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure why that's failing. Anyway, doesn't matter. Because it got us far enough to do this. So what matters is this, right? So K is, K is cluster one is set to true, and the other two are set to false. So that takes care of that part. The next part of our task is to go ahead and build the client configs. And for that, they have another script that they've created, which is this guy here. Let's take a look at that real quick. What this is going to do, it creates a service account. All right, so it takes a bunch of arguments, source context, source keep config, desk context, desk keep config, namespace, service account, It does a little munging of which context we're actually looking at. It creates an essay secret. It's actually pulling the secret out, creating the essay token. It looks at the essay token. It looks at the CA cert and the cluster name. It looks at the cluster address. And if the cluster address is 127001, then it changes it. Then it creates an output file of a cube config. And it creates the output secret with all of these things. It goes ahead and deletes the current secret and creates a new one if it doesn't already exist. Creates the kind config name. Basically translating the underscores to the two dashes. And here is the secret that it's going to create. And then it goes ahead and creates it. So this is just creating the secrets themselves, which is interesting because what they don't tell you is what the permissions are for that service account. That's deployed as a different part of the mechanism. So let's go ahead and run this command. So because in my case, kind cluster one is the control plane cluster, kind cluster two and three are the client cluster, are the data plane clusters. I'm going to go ahead and copy a cube config or create a cube config in kind cluster one for each of two and three. So if I go ahead and run that, 
And then I go ahead and do the same thing for number three. And I do kubectl get client config stash n k et Sandra. And we can see that there is a client config for cluster two and a client config for cluster three. So if I do kubectl get secrets dash n k et Sandra, you can see kind cluster two config and kind cluster three config. And one of the things that was interesting to me was if I go ahead and do kubectl get secret dash n k et Sandra. Yeah. Boop. Here is the secret, and you might be wondering what's in that secret. It's a cube config. And that cube config actually has everything it needs to interact with the cluster itself. But we'll also notice that the name is a token. And that token is the service account token for the um, K8 Center operator in that other cluster. So it's limited by the permissions that the operator has. You could all get service account. And let's do this as for each, each. And so there is our K8 sender operator. And I can do kubectl and I auth and list as system service account Keith Sandra Rater Keith Sandra Operator Ah dash N Kate Sandra operator. So what this permission does is scoped, which is pretty cool, but the permission is scoped specifically to things that are inside of the Kate Sandra namespace. And it does allow us to configure, to control things like deployments, but just to be able to get them to understand whether those things are working, we can do a create, delete, or watch on Kate Sandra clusters. We can do the same thing for uh, Medusa jobs, Kate Sandra tasks, but it's only allowing it, the permission that it copied to that first cluster is only scoped to those things that it manages in the second and third cluster, which I thought was, you know, I mean, that's a pretty reasonable implementation of Kubernetes security in that scenario. Pretty cool. All right. So the next thing we want to do, we have already created our client configs. We're going to go ahead and deploy our K8 Sender cluster. So let's see if this works. I'm going to show you what I have done differently. Because I have a full mesh, I can actually deploy this in a way that is actually in the overlay cluster itself. And I can and this will still allow for the nodes in both clusters to communicate with each other. And it will still allow for the operator at the top the in the control plane cluster to interact with the two clusters in the lower clusters. Because I have effectively flattened the pod sliders between all of the clusters in a mesh way, which means that I can actually create multiple Cassandra clusters in multiple data centers in multiple Kubernetes clusters and have all of them interconnect and communicate with each other without having to expose all of that to the outside world. So unlike the cluster unlike the cluster definition that we saw earlier, I'm going to set networking host network to false. I'm still going to create DC2. I'm going to create DC3. I'm using kind cluster 2 and kind cluster 3 for the context. I'm creating three nodes in each. 
I'm creating a Stargate instance. All of that will happen. So let's go ahead and deploy that and see what happens. Actually, you know what? I'm going to split the screen here. Keep kettle for each. Dash Q, kit, pod, dash in. Kate, Sandra, operator. This is where it actually gets deployed to. I'll do a watch. Apply, dash F, Kate, dash in, Kate, Sandra, operator. Boop. And away we go. So I have deployed this into Kind Cluster 1. The object that I just deployed was put into Kind Cluster 1, the control plane cluster. And here we see the magic happening, right? We actually see that Kind Cluster 1's Kate's operator is authenticating to Kind Cluster 2 and deploying a Cassandra database, a, a Cassandra cluster of three nodes as a stateful set into Kind Cluster 2 and interacting with it. Let's take a look at this in a slightly different way. This will be kind of fun. So while this is all happening, I'm going to do um, this. Keep it all expose deployment dash n cube system Hubble UI type load balancer in will dry LB get SVC. Okay, so that should give me access here. Eighty eighty one. Let's try this a different way. William Hubble, port forward. Well, observe. Why is that happening? Bum, bum, bum. It looks like we have a problem. Hubble peer, cube system, cube service, cluster that local, dial.
Everything's there, nothing's restarted. Huh. Interesting. Might have come across a bug. Keep kettle exec. TI dash in tube system. Yes, psyllium. Dash. Double status. Double sir. Nothing on this node for it, which is fine. Step into context two. There we go. All right, so here's a Hubble observe of the world. And we can see, for example, things in the Kate Sander operator, CAS operator talking to overlay. So that's traffic moving back and forth between the operator and demo DC2 default. And here is traffic coming from 10.201.40 or 10.202.140, and that's fine. I wanted to show intercluster traffic. Probably no replicas yet, which is fine. All right. Let's look at this in a different way again. Let's just do head. From identity two. All right, let's move on. So I'm not sure what's happening with Hubble Relay here at the moment. It'll restart dash in cube system. Limit Hubble Relay. It seems pretty unhappy with SPC dash in cube system. Pull peer endpoints. Uh, 
sees all of them. Yeah, something's wrong with the way this got deployed somehow. It's starting the GPRC, the GRPC server, but it's not able to create a peer client for synchronization, even though it's able to talk to all of the things. And when we actually did a Hubble observe inside of the node, we were able to see that. So 4244 was working for us. But for the Hubble relay, for some reason, it's not working. So looks like we got a bug. That's a shame. All right. Well, let's keep going. So let's take a look back at our deployment here. And we can see that we actually have our full deployment working now. So if we do that again, up here at the top in cluster one, we have our <coughs> CAS operator and our K sender operator, and that's all running in here. And then in each of our data plane clusters, two and three, we have our deployment. And if we do a control, kubectl describe K sandra cluster, we can see that we're in a pretty healthy state. There are no errors. DC3 has been deployed and is running. DC2 is deployed and running. All of the connectivity necessary to get those things up and running is functional. Let's take a look at the next piece of the test here, which is uh, over here. We got things all deployed. We see everything working, very cool. Let's go ahead and do this test. See demo super, super user. We're going to grab the password also. Here we go. Generated password. Let's go ahead and do this next bit. Oh, nice! I I see another for each in our con in our in our uh, world here. So what I need to do, keep get all for each dash Q, paste that in, and we'll use all of the same commands except that we will use the oh, I see. Not really a way to do it, is there? No. All right. Well. 
to what the command was. Okay, so we see this all working. We see the data cluster. We see 10.202 and 10.203 from kind cluster two and from kind cluster three. And DC three. We see the same. So we have full connectivity working. Just a few operations might be kind of fun. Let's try that. So we're going to jump into the bash operator. Let's try that. Yes, you. There we go. All right, so now we're in. Describe key spaces. So eat. And then we'll do use tests. And then we'll create a table called users. Do some inserts here. Do I select? And there we have it. <clears throat> so we could also, I'm actually curious about something here. Let's try to access this from outside and see if we can actually do it at that point. So if I were to do, uh, say, Paru CQLSH. Wow, 
Most of them are out of date. Let's go with number three, I guess. Mm. Oh, thank you, Nuno. Yay. Good to see you, Nuno. All right. Well, I'm going to actually call this because I think we've been at this for a while, but I kind of wanted to show access from outside the cluster, but I'm also kind of feeling a little tired. So I'm not sure that we're going to get all the way through it here. Let's give it a few more seconds to get this built, and then we'll try accessing the service, the uh, the Stargate service, which will be pretty interesting. I don't see that happen. Okay, this next desktop, CQLSH. Purple. Oh, it doesn't have a version. It's probably tied to a version. So what is the Did we finally finish? Okay. QL S H nice. Ah. Oh, those are ancient. All right. Mike Rice got me, though. Boop. Docker. 
run it. Dash dash network time. Dash. Give that a minute, and then we'll make it work from the outside, and then we'll call it. So what I wanted to see, actually, um, Ah, it's part of the overlay. So we can't get it from the outside because it's part of the overlay. But if we expose the service, we could do it. Anyway, interesting stuff. I hope that this was educational for you. I had a great time kind of exploring it. There's a ton to learn out here in this whole space. Um, but yeah, pretty cool stuff. I hope that you had a, I hope you had a blast. I had a blast like exploring this stuff. I know it's a complex topic. In fact, I know that it's a number of complex topics. But it is pretty neat how the Cade Sander operator works. It is pretty neat what Cilium can do with it. Like we can observe all of the traffic moving back and forth. We showed you with a Hubble Observe. We can also secure this traffic. So even though it's in the host network, I could actually still write network policy that limits access to these things so that I can harden or tie down the access between things and between things that are trying to access that Cassandra database on ingress. So that's actually pretty neat as well. There's a ton of real great capability that we can get into here. But I hope this was educational. I'll see you all next time. I hope you have the best weekend of your life. Thank you all for hanging out with me. And we'll see you next time.